I guess the first thing to be said about this book, which, which I've had a, a lot of fun with and, and uh, the extra pleasure of working with a, a longtime colleague, Margaret Eaton, is that w we first got the assignment of helping uh, the Lasker Trust organize a forum that dealt exactly with the problem of when does in innovative technology become research and therefore become a matter of public interest in the regulatory and ethical structure governing it. And so we decided to approach this by doing some case studies. And I'll let Margaret talk about that because she's so experienced at teaching from case materials. She teaches both medical students and, uh, and MBA students. Uh, that that uh, uh, I guess our, our joint interest in this flows more from her than from me. Mm. What we were interested in doing, I think, was looking at this borderline between technologies, medical technologies that enter into use for patients through a regulatory and a research route versus those technologies that become useful to patients because physicians are using them in their practice and innovating as they go. So we do a lot of, um, there's a lot of historical examples in the book, one of which is um, a physician by the name of Bailey who is at Hahnemann Medical Center in Philadelphia and he was the pioneering surgeon to do the first mitral valve surgeries. Um, and surgeries are typically not regulated. A surgeon can innovate anytime, anywhere, whenever they think the patient needs it. But um, this particular physician was, developed this, these tools and this technique to repair damaged mitral valves. His first patient died, 46-year-old patient. His second patient died on the table, 37 years old. Um, the chief of the hospital got very worried at that point, thinking, what's this surgeon up to? Mm. Um, but th every time that a, a patient um, suffered or died in his experience, he learned something. So he kept doing the surgeries until the chief of staff said, you have to stop. So he went to another hospital, got privileges there, and started doing it. And his patients were dying you know, on the table five weeks later, but he was learning as he was going. And eventually, um, he decided that they were both hospitals were going to stop him from doing this because of the mortality rate. He went to a third hospital, scheduled a surgery in the morning, and then scheduled another one for the afternoon, thinking that if the first patient um, um, met its maker in the morning, the second hospital wouldn't know it in time for him to do it uh, in the afternoon. Anyway, that afternoon patient survived. Uh, he ended up taking her to the next heart meeting um, and showing her um, to the medical community as the first surviving patient of a mitral valve surgery. That is the root of innovation in practice that we were interested in looking at. What ethical issues arise from that? What social benefits? What social harms? Should it be regulated? How do you teach um, the lessons that are learned from that kind of avenue of innovative um, pathways. Um, and we were looking at it from the inventor's perspective, the physician's perspective, and that's kind of in a nutshell, I think, the, the gist of um, our focus for the book. We tried to make that point, and, and uh, I don't remember who got the idea first, but there were two wonderful pieces in The New Yorker about physicians oh, yes. and the reactions they got. Uh, one of them dealt with a, a brilliant and, and famous Har Harvard surgeon who in, in effect made his first spectacular professional success in dealing badly burned patients after the famous Coconut Grove fire in Boston in the, in the early 40s. Uh, his philosophy in the beginning was almost a cowboy philosophy. Yeah. I don't think he would have left as many patients on the, dying on the table as the doctor <laughs> in Philadelphia did, but nevertheless, he, he wanted to try things. He was passionately devoted to his patients and their success and, and also to the residents he was training. As he got older, he became much more cautious. And, uh, and in fact, a lot of, of people ask themselves, uh, if I develop some life-threatening illness, do I want to be in the hands of the young Dr. Moore, right. who was this cowboy experimenter who will try stuff, or do I want to be in the hands of the the, the cautious deputy sheriff who will make sure that everything is okay before he moves. It's, it's a very, very interesting 
contrast in people's attitudes as well as in the realities of medical practice. Right, and lots of times patients in those situations have run out of options, and they do want the cowboy surgeon or physician who's going to pull out all the stops, do anything that, that's conceivable mm -hmm. to save their life, and so sometimes this is not just physician-driven, it's patient-driven. You know, and lessons learned from those experiences go on becoming embedded in medical practice. Yeah. And the question is, you know, is there enough data to support it? You know, and was this a wise thing to do for everybody involved? And it's a fascinating question.